Dad, so glad to have you today um, for our third service of the day as we uh, jump into part two of our series, Attacking Anxiety. This is a journey that we're on as a church, looking at these three uh, verses that Paul writes uh, to uh, his friends in the church in Philippi uh, that really serve for us as a means by which you and I, when applied today, can experience peace even when we're in situations that do not feel Peaceful. Uh, and last week, if you were with us, uh, we kind of kicked off our conversation by asking this question, why should we even uh, choose to go down this path? Why should we go on a journey of trying to be a people that attack anxiety? And we were reminded of these truths. And if you weren't able to hear the message, I encourage you to jump online and watch it when you can. But what we discovered was this, is that because God is for you and because God is with you always, you and I can experience the peace of God. That there's a promise that's given to us that seems impossible possible at first, but I really do believe is something that is available to all of us, that complete peace is actually possible. And that for me, this series is not a series of me simply teaching some words out of a text, but it has really been a journey that I've been on over the last 18 months as somebody who was diagnosed with anxiety myself and needed to step into a place of actually being on medication to deal with the wildfire of fear that was spreading through my soul and through my mind. And so what I'm teaching over the next couple of weeks is not simply information I think could be helpful to you, but what I'm teaching are the tools and the principles that change the game for me and allowed me to step out of that season of incredible anxiety into a current season of incredible peace. Now there's a promise that's for every single one of us and it's this, we can attack anxiety when anxiety attacks us. We don't have to be people that are constricted to, constrained to, and uh, chained to our worry and our fear of the future. But I want to be careful here because I want to remind us of a couple of things. One is that anxiety for many of us is not just a spiritual issue. It's a mental issue. It's a biological issue. And it's a physical issue. And all of those components are essential to understand uh, what it means to be people that overcome anxiety. In fact, to help us along that journey, next week, Walkiria de Jesus, she's a psychologist, is going to be offering a course at the 1115 in the media center. And especially if you're a parent, I think you should be there and be engaged there because she's going to be helping you diagnose and understand what the difference is between normal teenage angst, right, and actually some severe signs of anxiety in your kids and in your family. Uh, we are taking a holistic approach to this because uh, anxiety has gotten a bad rap in the, in the church. Uh, there are some churches that never talk about this topic at all. There are other communities of faith that maybe you grew up in where the answer to uh, anxiety was just, just try harder, just believe more. And the reason why you're anxious is it's all your fault. But the reality is that that's not the case, is it? Because anxiety, in many ways, is actually something God has given us for our good. To, to be worried or to be afraid in a moment is actually what prevents us from doing really, really terrible things. Did you know that? Uh, anxiety in a moment is not the problem. In fact, about 12 years ago, um, I was coaching a homeschool basketball team, all right? Um, just to kind of explain to you, um, homeschool basketball teams are not like winning state championships, if that uh, makes sense. And so uh, I'm coaching this team, and we go out to play at this big public school, kind of in uh, the middle of nowhere. And these little boys are just getting whooped. I mean, it is a massacre what they are experiencing. I mean, these 14-year-olds on the other team look like 41-year-olds with a, with a Roth IRA, with a retirement account, and grandkids. All right? I mean, it was nuts. The age, like differential, like the skill differential. They're dunking on our kids. I mean, it's bad. Kids are crying, you know, and they're talking trash in mental note. If you don't think that talking trash is a normal part of basketball, I question your life choices as a person, all right? It's an essential part of the game. But what's not essential is having parents add on to the trash talking. And the worst part was that the mamas of these 41-year-old, 14-year-olds, right, were talking trash to my homeschool kids. And they were saying things like, you should just quit. Don't play basketball ever again. I'm so happy I'm not your parent. Look how bad that boy is. A kid would airball a shot. They'd all bust out laughing. I mean, it was horrific. 
To the point where by the time the game was over, I decided to go over and have a cordial conversation with these parents because I think that, you know, sportsmanship is important. So I walk over to the parents and I introduce myself and I say, hey, uh, my name's Colin and I just want to let you know that, like, I think that competitive competitive sports is great, competition is great, but I I think that some of the things that you said were kind of hurtful to the boys and and, and hurtful to a degree where as a 13 or 14-year-old, I don't know, they're still kind of building confidence. Maybe next time we play or maybe next time we're kind of you're at a game, would you consider maybe not being so kind of aggressive towards the kids that are on the court? And they said, okay. And so I said, great. I kind of walked over to my team, kind of held them up, said everybody's kind of crying. It's like, it's okay, boys. It's all right. We'll get some Chick-fil-A, eat some ice cream. You'll feel better about your life. You know, like we'll be all right. And as I'm doing that, um, as I'm kind of with my group, across from the court, right, I hear this voice yell out and it goes, hey, I heard you talk about my mama. Now, I didn't think that the person yelling was talking to me at all, so I'm kind of still with my group. And then I hear, hey, skinny brown dude, I heard you talk about my mama. I knew that was me at that point. (laughs) I turn, and this guy looks at me and goes, hey, I got something for you in the trunk. Now, to all my light-skinned friends that are like, are those Girl Scout cookies? No, he's referring to a weapon, all right? Here's the deal. I was a little bit nervous and a little stressed out when I heard that phrase, right? And that was a good thing that I had a little bit of stress and anxiety in that moment because it allowed me to make a better decision. Um, I waited for a car to pull around the side of the building. I got in the car face down on the floorboards and we took off. (laughs) And your boy is alive, all right? (laughs) Hear me. Your fear... And your anxiety in a moment is not problematic. It's when fear and anxiety are no longer in a momentum, but, or in a moment, but they're causing momentum in your life. When anxiety becomes momentum, when you find yourself with this little wildfire of fear that begins to spread to every interaction you have, every relationship you're in, the way that you relate to your coworkers, the way you relate to your spouse or to your roommates or to your friends, that's really when the issue becomes all the more palpable. And you and I know the cycle of anxiety, don't we? I mean, we've been through it. It works this way. You begin to feel anxious about something. Kind of pick whatever it is that you want to feel anxious about, right? And then here's the next step. You attempt to control it. And we all do this. This is human nature. When we feel like worried or attacked or concerned, we try to find a way to control. And for some of us, control looks like manipulation. We have conversations. We kind of try to speak around the edge. We try to figure out a way to get things to work the way that we want them to work. We talk about people instead of to people, right? That's what we do. Or for others of us, we just avoid it. And avoidance is just another form of control. We kind of close our eyes and pretend like everything's okay and nothing's going on when in all reality, all we're doing is delaying the inevitability of that thing still being there. So what happens? We attempt to control and then we fear losing control. We either get some form of control or we don't get it at all and we begin to feel life kind of careening out of uh, control. We try to do something to grab it. So what do we do? We try to attempt to control again. So we get more manipulative. We live in more denial. We say harsher things. We become uh, more nagging towards the people around us. We gossip more. We do whatever is necessary to try to consolidate some form of control, which only leads to what? Us feeling more anxious. And as this happens to the best of us, those of us who love Jesus a ton, those of us that have been walking with Jesus forever, as we try to gain control of our life and our surroundings and everything around us, we get more exhausted, more irritable, more difficult to be around, and our soul begins to erode. And the question is, how do we break the cycle? How do we break the cycle? That's what I want to do and talk about over the next three weeks. Is I really do believe that there are actual, practical, applicable choices that you and I can make. Literally, decisions we can make five minutes after this message that can break the cycle of anxiety and restore us to a place of peace. Because anxiety attacks when we believe the lie that we can control things we can't. Like parents, we're not ultimately in control of our kids. We know of great parents that have terrible kids. And we know of terrible parents that have great kids. You're not the Lord of your kids. You're just a steward. We know people in our business that should not be promoted who always get promoted. And we know of people that should get promoted that seem to be overlooked. And we're not the Lord of our company 
or our financial situation. <laughs> we know of people that are married that should have never gotten married. And we know of people that are right to be married that have yet to experience marriage. And we're not the Lord of our relational status. We're just, we're just stewards. And when you and I believe the lie that we can control things that we're not in control of, anxiety runs rampant through our life. But just as vital and important as that is recognizing that anxiety attacks when we believe the lie, the second lie, that God is no longer in control. That the situation or circumstance that we're in, God must not be in control of it because if God was in control, surely he would not allow this to happen. Surely if God was in control, he would have a better plan. Surely if God was in control, this would not be occurring. So let me just help God out, right? I'm going to help God out so that God gets on my agenda and on my page. And that begins to breed anxiety in our life as well. And here's what you need to know. I think John Mark Comer puts it so well. Anxiety at its core is this. Anxiety is temporary atheism. That's what it is. It's in a moment we, we forget who we are and who God is. In a moment we forget that there's a God in the universe who loves us and knows us by name and he's there for us. And we all experience the moment of anxiety. The key is not allowing anxiety to get momentum in our life. And Paul knows this. So Paul writes to the church at Philippi, a group of people that love Jesus but are surrounded by a Roman garrison who have put a death sentence out on anyone who's a follower of Jesus because it, to them it's like being a traitor to Rome. And under that setting, he writes these words. Imagine if you could that as we're gathered today, we would be fearful that when we walk out of these doors, we would be killed on the spot. That's the level of anxiety and concern and worry those that are receiving this letter are experiencing. And Paul has the audacity to say, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, that's what we're going to look at today, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then he makes this promise that when you do this, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So today I want to talk to you about the first tool that when we apply it to our life, changes the game. And it's something that you've heard before, but I don't want you to write it off because I think in some ways, because we don't have the right perspective on this thing, we're actually not experiencing the peace that comes as a result of using it. And it's prayer. Write this down. Prayer is an exchange of my perspective for God's power. That if you look at the actual Greek root word for the word prayer, it is a literal process of exchange. It's not simply saying nice words and kind of speaking up to heaven or speaking up to the, the clouds. It's not going through a rote tradition or kind of doing things that we grew up with. Prayer is an exchange. At the core of prayer is this idea that I have something and I'm giving it to someone else so that I can receive something else in return. And prayer is the process where I give my perspective, the way I'm seeing the world, the way I'm interpreting my circumstances, the way I'm believing things to be. I'm handing that to God and I'm asking God to give me in exchange what is true and what is right and what is real. Because here's what anxiety is. Anxiety is a feeling. Anxiety is an emotion. And this is what you need to know. Mature people engage their emotion, but they embrace the truth. Do you see the difference? Wise people engage their emotion. They don't pretend like it's not there. I'm feeling worried. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling nervous. But they never hug that. They only hug what is true. And prayer allows us to hold on to what is true and to let go of what is simply what we feel. The practice of prayer as exchange ultimately reminds us of who is in control. And so today, I want to be incredibly practical by sharing with you a prayer that over the last year in my life, it's the prayer I start my morning with, the prayer I end my day with, the prayer that I step into meetings with, the prayer that when I'm in the middle of traffic, ticked off, saying words I shouldn't say, I pray it there to get my peace restored. It's the prayer that changed my life. It's the prayer that I would say has helped me move to a place of being able to experience anxiety in a moment, but not, let, allow, not allow anxiety to take momentum in my life. It's a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. It's a prayer that you've heard if you've ever been on a football team, watched a football game, or seen Remember the Titans, okay? It's the Lord's Prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we find this. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. 
Now, I want you to pay attention to this because some of us have believed the lie that prayer is something you're either just good at, like you're just naturally gifted at it, or you're not good at, right? Like we all know what that's like, right? You ever been in a prayer situation, right, maybe around Thanksgiving, and you realize, oh, there are some varsity prayers in the room, you know? There's like us JV prayers, right, us like ninth grade team that got cut prayers, right? And then there are like the varsity prayers, like they're the ones at Thanksgiving, like when they pray, like the turkey levitates, you know what I'm saying? Like those types of prayers. And we can sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, like that, that's for some people, not for me. Here's what I need you to know, is that prayer is not natural, it's actually learned. That's why the text says, teach us to pray. That there's a way of praying that Jesus wants us to experience. The way of Jesus, the way of prayer that changes our life and creates peace in us that otherwise cannot exist. Matthew 6, 9, 13, Jesus responds to the request and he says this. This then is how you should pray, meaning there is a way to pray. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Jesus says, this is how you should address your heavenly father. This is how you ought to speak to the creator of the universe. And as you exchange your perspective, when you pray this way, you will receive a peace that comes from heaven. And there's an order to this. And there's a chronology to this. And there's a reason why it's the way that it is. So I want to walk you through the way of prayer today. It starts with this. Declare God's character. Write this down in your notes. Declare God's character. You and I should begin our time of prayer, whether or not it's in the morning or whether or not it's before dinner or whether or not it's before we go into a meeting, beginning with an acknowledgement of God's character. Look, look what the text says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is why it's so important. Because many of us don't start our prayers by acknowledging the character of God. We start our prayers by acknowledging our needs, right? God, give me this place, this conversation, work this thing out. Give me that parking place at Target, Lord, the one in the front. Give, me the, give my kids the teacher who's really nice. Give me the good discount when I go pick up their clothes. Like, God, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, right? We'll get to that. Here's why you don't want to start your prayers that way. It's not because God won't hear them. He'll hear them. It's because it won't give you peace. When you start your life focused on you and what you need, you will not experience the peace of God because peace comes from being in the presence of God. Peace comes from recognizing who God is. And let's be honest, we forget who God is all the time, don't we? Uh, the God who creates, sustains, and holds everything together, look at this, calls you his beloved child and invites you to address him as dad. Is that not crazy? Is it not crazy that the creator of the universe who can speak galaxies with a simple whisper of his voice looks at you, says he's deeply interested in your life and invites you to call him daddy. That word father is Abba, which is the most intimate term utilized in that culture to describe a relationship between a child and a father. Saying father, daddy, the God of the universe has your picture on his refrigerator. And he loves you. And he's deeply connected to your life. Remember this. God doesn't need to be reminded of his character. The reason why Jesus tells us to begin by praying about God's character. You're my father. Holy, hallowed, set apart is your name. Your majesty, your beauty, and your brilliance. Our reason for focusing on the beauty and brilliance of God is not because God's up in heaven needing to be reminded of who he is. You know? It's not like he's like, I I'm, a, I'm a father. Like that's not happening. It's not, I'm, I'm in control. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got things to do. Like, that's not what's going on. It's not like God's like, oh, stop it, stop it. Keep on coming. Like, that's not what's going on. God doesn't need our affirmation. We, God doesn't need to be reminded of his character. We do. We need to be reminded that God is who he is, that he's in control, that he's powerful, that he's sovereign, that he's gracious and kind. Because our anxiety is rooted in our temporary atheism or forgetting these things to even be the case. Which begs this question. Will you allow the size of your circumstances to determine your view of God? Or will you allow your view of God to determine the size of your circumstances? For too many of us, we're looking at the obstacle and we're acting like that's the biggest thing in the room. No, the biggest thing in the room is the presence and power of God. And when I see God for who he is, it allows me to see my situation for what it really is. 
under God's control, under God's command. And with God, anything is possible. So the first thing is we declare God's character. Here's the second one, surrender your will. And this really is the speed bump in the storyline, okay? Because it's a lot easier for me to talk about how good God is than it is for me to acknowledge that maybe the way that I want my life to work isn't the way that it's going to. Look what the text says. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Meaning, God, I've, I've got a kingdom, I've got a plan and a direction for my life, and I want to surrender that to what you think is best. God, I got a plan for my schedule and my day. There's some things I got to get checked off. I've got an Excel spreadsheet with all of the things that need to occur. I've got a conversation that I've got to have here. I've got a meeting that I've got to make. But today, God, I'm going to acknowledge that if none of that gets done and you have a different plan for today, the day is going to be best in your hands, not in mine. Many of us do not experience the freedom, the freedom of peace. Because we're trying to hold on to and control our days and our future instead of surrendering them to our Father who knows best. Um, two summers ago, uh, my wife uh, and a good friend of ours, Rachel, were on the beach in, uh, um, in Costa Rica on the Pacific coast. And uh, they were learning how to surf. Stacy was on the beach and Rachel went into the water. And uh, Stacy was kind of watching Rachel from afar. She just kind of saw Rachel continually drift further and further and further away from the shore. So eventually, after about 30 minutes, Stacy decided, I should probably get in the water and see what's going on. She gets in the water, takes a couple of steps, and she gets swept up into a riptide. You ever been in a rip current before? And the rip tide just begins to push and pull, uh, pull um, Stacy out away from the shore. So now her and Rachel are just kind of rapidly moving away from the shore. Now, if you've ever been in a rip current before, you know this to be true, that the worst thing that you can do in a rip current is what? Try and swim against the current. Because the more you fight against the current, the more energy you lose, the more exhausted you become. And most, if not the overwhelming majority of people, die from riptides, not because the riptide took them too far away from the shore, but because they tried to fight against the current and they ended up drowning. And I would suggest to some of us that the reason why you feel like your head is just above water when it comes to life is because you are fighting against the direction that God is taking you. The thing that's unsettling about being in a rip current is that a rip current is unsettling. It feels, you feel weightless in that situation. You don't feel like you're under control. But the best thing you can do if you want to get to safety is to work with the current, not against it. Look at me. When you and I don't surrender, we waste our energy and we get nowhere. And I wonder if the reason why you're so stressed out, why you're so anxious, why you're so burdened, why you're spouting off at people that you say that you love, why you're exploding in anger, why you're not getting good rest, why you're struggling so much and trying to hold everything together, why you're kind of internally as angry as you are is maybe because you haven't recognized that God's plan for your life is better for, than your plan for your life. And the best thing you can do is to surrender to him. So here's the question. Are you willing to trust that what God chooses to do is what's best for you? That God, my financial situation may not be the one that I want or the way that I thought it was going to be, but I'm choosing to trust that right now that you're doing what's best for me. That your no is actually for my protection. God, God I wish that my relationship status was different, and I'm going to keep asking you for something different than the current reality, but I'm going to choose to trust today that if it doesn't happen the way that I want it to happen, I'm still going to believe that your way is best. The antidote to anxiety is surrendering control of things that we've never been meant to be in control of in the first place. So we don't begin by saying, God, I need you to give me all this stuff because we think that we need that stuff. No, no. Imagine the context of when we start our prayers acknowledging, God, you're good, you're in control, and you're my father and you love me. So because that's the case, I can surrender my plan to you and know that you're going to give me exactly what I need, exactly when I need it. Which leads us to the last reality, is that when you pray, ask without shame. I love the text. It says, give us. In fact, would you say that with me on the count of three? One, two, three. Give us. My kids love to use these two words. Give me, give me. It's amazing to me how much my kids are immune to the word no. I mean, we walk by Claire's every single time, and my kids are like, Daddy, can we go to Claire's? And the answer is always no. 
We walk by Marble Slab Creamery and they say, Daddy, can we get ice cream? And the answer is always yes, because Daddy wants ice cream. <laughs> but my kids are immune to no. I want you to look at how this is phrased. Give us today our daily bread. There's no conditions connected to that. There's no, would you give me, maybe, possibly, potentially, hey, let me negotiate with you, God. No, just straight up, God, I want you to give me what I need. God, would you provide for me? Would you forgive me of my debt as I forgive others? This is what the prayer is saying. Ask God without shame for the things you need. Look at this list and tell me if not all of those things are connected to our anxiety and worry. God, I'm worried about provision. <laughs> for me, for my friends, for my family, for my kids. God, I I'm anxious and worried because of the fact that I did something in the past that I think is going to come back to haunt me. And God, I I'm consistently ruined by remembering the worst decisions of my past. God, would you forgive me and erase that from my mind? God, I don't know what decision to make. I, I've got a couple of decisions to make about this job or about this future, about this direction. God, I, I'm going to stop trying to find all the answers. Would you just lead me? And God, would you protect me? I don't know what's around the corner. These are the things you and I tend to be worried about. These are the categories. And in every single one, God simply says, Jesus simply invites us to say, declare God's character, surrender your will, and then ask without shame. Which as parents, I find that we don't do a very good job of conditioning our kids to, and we don't do a very good job doing ourselves. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my daughter, uh, my seven-year-old and my nine-year-old, both of them, went to lunch with my aunt to Chick-fil-A. And uh, my seven-year-old doesn't like Chick-fil-A very much, and so they go to Chick-fil-A. My aunt orders food. My daughter says, hey, I don't like Chick-fil-A. Can we go to Wendy's? And my aunt says, Yes. <laughs> And takes my seven-year-old to Wendy's. And I'm incredibly disappointed when I realize this, right? Like, like how do you pick Wendy's over Chick-fil-A? Like, that is God's chicken. Like, I'm so concerned. So I hear this story, and I actually recount this story to Jen. We're in the office, and, and, and my seven-year-old is right there with me. And I recount the story, and I say, I can't believe, like, you know, that Elise did this. Like, Elise, you can't do things like that. You just got to be grateful for what you have. And then Jen grabs Elise, holds her in a big bear hug, looks at her and says, Elise, good job being brave and asking boldly for what you want in life. That's the way to live. And then they both look at me, and I realize I'm a terrible father. <laughs> Because it's true. Just be grateful for what you have is not the vision that God gives us for a life of abundance and fullness. God says, ask for whatever you want without shame. Ask for whatever you want without shame. There's power in asking. In fact, Jesus puts it this way. You have not because you ask not. You know, I think about my Nana. Um, she's one of my heroes. She has a third grade education. At the age of 14 in Jamaica, she um, interacted with a couple that was on vacation in Bermuda. She had spent maybe 24 hours with them, kind of getting to know them. And this 14-year-old with a third grade education looks at this couple and says, would you take me back on the boat with you to Bermuda? She asks. And they said yes. So this 14-year-old moves to Bermuda and starts doing some different jobs and is kind of working around the house. And she meets this guy that um, we call Genie Boy. And her and Genie Boy start uh, dating a little bit. And Genie Boy really likes uh, my grandmother, and, and my grandmother really loves him. And uh, they go out to dinner one night. It's been a while, and Genie Boy just has not popped the question yet. So my Nana leans in, and Nana asks Genie Boy if she can have his hand in marriage. And he says yes. And they have a little boy named Bobby. And then my Nana, later on, has this vision for a restaurant. And she doesn't have the money or the collateral or the means to be able to do it on her own, but she goes to the bank anyway, and she asks for a loan. And they say, hey, we're not going to give you a loan unless you get somebody to co-sign on it. And she doesn't really know a whole lot of people. So she goes to this guy who never has co-signed on anything before, her father-in-law of all people. And she says, hey, I've got a vision for this restaurant. And he kind of begrudgingly says, okay, and he signs it anyway, co-signs that. She buys the restaurant, makes enough money to send little Bobby to a private school. And little Bobby becomes a valedictorian of that school and gets a scholarship to move to the coast of Florida to study in the States. And then he heads down to South Florida and he meets a little boy who's about two years old and begins playing with that boy and falls in love with that boy over the summer, falls in love with the boy's mama over the summer. They get married. They move to California. They move back to Orlando. That little boy comes to fall 
love with Jesus and start this church called Nona Church. And the reason why you are here, look at me, is because Nana had the audacity to ask. And I wonder, I wonder what's on the other side of your asking. I wonder what's on the other side of your willingness to unashamedly ask your heavenly Father and creator of the universe for what you not only need, but what you want. No conditions, no negotiations, just ask. What do you unashamedly need to ask your heavenly Father for? Some of us are withholding our request. We're asking for simple things instead of the big things. And I want you to hear me say today that God honors bold prayers because bold prayers honor God. And if it's on your mind, look here, it's already on God's heart. If it's in your dream, God's already been dreaming about it. If it's something you've been worried about, God's already been working on it. And the best place for you to go is to your heavenly father. This has been my journey over the last year. And this is the next step I want to offer to you today. That in the midst of the anxiety cycle, when you begin to feel anxious, engage your emotion, but then embrace the truth by practicing the Lord's prayer. Because there's something powerful about being in an argument and in the midst of that saying, my Father in heaven and recognizing he's with me and he's in the room. There's something powerful about wondering about what that health diagnosis is going to be like and saying, your kingdom come, your will be done. And knowing that God's already working it out. He's already got a purpose and a plan and it's better than the one you've ever dreamed up for your life. As you're sitting there wondering when the relationship's gonna come, when the promotion's gonna be there, when the money's gonna be right, recognizing you can ask God for everything you want without shame and he smiles on his face when you do because your father wants to know what's on your heart because it's already been on his mind. So don't hold back. Last year or so, I've been trying to start my mornings either on my knees or sometimes in the shower or sometimes when I'm in my car. My Father in heaven. I'm a beloved son of the creator of the universe. My Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, today you've got my back. You're going before me in these meetings. You're going before me in these hard conversations. You're going before my kids who I stress out about sending to school if they're going to make friends and if they're going to connect. God, you're going before them. So would you give me today? God, would you give me today the peace I need, the strength I need, the courage I need? And when you start that day, you start your day that way, you end your day that way. And when you step into your meetings that way, and when you deal with conflict that way, Peace from heaven, it meets you in a powerful way. So declare God's character. Start there when you meet him. Surrender your will and recognize his plan is better than your own. And ask without shame. And peace from heaven will meet you where you are. Would you stand with me as we pray?